Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the next installment of a very popular In Conversation series. Uh, and tonight, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce to you Sir Trevor MacDonald. Uh, he's one of uh, our guests who really hardly needs any introduction. He's the author of a famous book, which I'm holding up uh, in front of me, um, uh, which I've read uh, ahead of this interview. And he's a part of all of our lives, really. Uh, the news at 10 every evening, we used to tune in to watch him on uh, ITN uh, and also on Channel 4 when it was launched. So, uh, so Trevor, thank you so much for, for joining me this evening. Uh, and uh, I'd like to start off this um, interview by asking you about um, your book and about the first chapter, which um, was your interview with Barack Obama and your attendance at his uh, inauguration, which I, I think was a seminal world event, wasn't it? You certainly described uh, it as that. Thank you very much, Professor Kirby. It's a, it's a great, great pleasure to be to talking to you and people um, from the society. Um, yes, it was a wonderful thing to be able to do. Um, I never thought, and I'd been to America a lot before his inauguration, and I never thought I'd see anything quite like it. And I think for many of the people who were gathered outside the White House on the Mall that day in Washington, many never thought and said, some said to me, you know, we never thought we would live to see this day. So it was a great, great occasion. And I was very, very lucky to be asked to be, be, be there for, for uh, ITV. And um, I, I thought it was a wonderful, wonderful occasion. And it was a, a step forward for... Uh because it was the first black uh, president of the United States, obviously. Uh, and I, 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 the reason I wanted to start off with that uh, was because of the Black Lives Matter issue that um, uh, we are dealing with right now. And now, do you think that Black Lives Matter is a, is a positive thing or is it an, uh, I'd just like to hear your opinion on, on, on that. It's a very good conjunction you have made between the Obama inauguration and the uh, movement Black Lives Matter, because in a way, I think it shows that the promise that the Obama inauguration had, you know, within it, all that it symbolized, seems to have been lost a little. The Black Lives Matter movement began um, because of the death of George Floyd. And um, when I look back at that now, and every time I think closely about it, I have this view that putting your knee on somebody's neck for nine minutes has nothing to do with policing. Um, and it, it seemed to suggest that people were looked at and imagined in, in a, a, a different way. And I think the difference certainly from the mood and the feeling that swept the country when Obama was inaugurated certainly you couldn't think of those two things as um, events which would, which would happen in the same vein. We felt that the Obama inauguration signaled the beginning of better times in America, which has always had a, 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 a torrid history about race relations. But sadly, it has proved that that is not the case. Do you think that the, I mean, we don't want to get too political on this program, but um, President Trump, certainly not my favorite uh, politician. I mean, he, he sort of has taken a, a view that everything, that every achievement of, of President Obama seems to have been uh, sort of targeted by, by Donald Trump. Uh, and in, a, in a, almost in a vindictive way, did, did, is that your feeling too? Well, he certainly has no, um, no, no sort of warm, comradely f f feelings for Obama. I think it's because uh, the president is irked by the fact that he was preceded in the White House by a very bright, very elegant black man. And the president seems to have problems coming, coming to terms with that. And of course, he, he went further even before the inauguration. He tried to suggest that Barack Obama had no right running for the presidency because he was not born in America. When that was palpably untrue, Trump knew that it was untrue and yet continued to perpetrate 
um, that 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 um, mistruth. So um, no, there 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 are no good feelings be, be, between the, you know certainly Trump and 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 Obama. But the Black Lives Movement came out, I think, entirely entirely differently, and and not surprisingly, because I feel that so much of what the Obama inauguration symbolized has has not come to any uh, has not come to any good. And I think you know at at um, I forget the town in 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 um, in Virginia, where there was a demonstration and where there were white supremacists and uh, and other protesters, and Trump said that there were good people on both sides, showed a little too much of what he thought about the way race relations had gone in America, and he does seem to sympathize with 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 white supremacists a little more than. Presidents in the past have done, if ever. Mm, absolutely. And do you think? Are you surprised that the traction that Black Lives Matter seems to have uh, have got? You know, it was one person with one ghastly event in America, but it's become a global phenomenon. And certainly at the RSM, we're very we feel positively about it because uh, we are anti-racist uh, uh, to our core at the RSM. I've always been very bad at predicting things, and some of the things I predicted have gone um, entirely the other way. But I never would have thought that it would have got so much momentum, and um, momentum which has proved to be universal. Mm -hmm. I'm astonished to see people in the Netherlands and people in 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 you know in in Southern Africa and people in India and people all over the world joining in this movement at big sporting occasions you see people, people being aware of it. And with it goes a general call to try to eradicate all forms of racism from the society. Uh, of course, that's probably a long, long, long way off. But that that movement should have given uh, a, a source of encouragement and strength to such a feeling, I think is, 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 quite, is quite sensational. Trevor, let's go back, or Sir Trevor, I should say, Sir Trevor OBE. Trevor is fine. <laughs> Trevor's fine, that's nice. Um, Trevor, let, let's go back to your, the beginnings of your life in Trinidad. And, and I mean, your career, the, the name of your book is Improbable Life. I mean, your career is improbable, isn't it, really? We're, you know, where you start, just tell us a, bit, a little bit about how, how it all began. I chose that, that title. Um, because I could never have imagined growing up in a small country in the West Indies, a small island in the Caribbean, that I would ever have been given the chance to do all the things that I, I have been given the chance to do. Um, and so it, 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 it is in every way Im, improbable. Um, yeah. I think it's Robert Frost. Um, you talked about my love of literature, and I think Robert Frost talked in one poem about where he said, you know, two roads diverged and I, I took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference. I took the road to journalism, which got me from the West Indies to first to Bush House, a BBC uh, uh, a place in the old which then in those days, um, the overseas, the world service of the BBC, an excellent service. Um, and from there, I went to ITN. And never in my dreams would I have imagined that one day I would be in Baghdad or in, you know, Johannesburg or in southern India or in, in China or in the United States covering presidential elections. I would never, never have, have, have imagined. But I must give in this context some credit to my parents who were not formerly brilliantly educated, but who seem to have had a very clear view of what their offspring or what certainly what I needed to do if I was to succeed in a very naughty world. And um, a, a great, great, great deal of the credit goes, goes to them for what, what I eventually um, did with my life. Did, did they sacrifice their things to for your education and very much so yeah, very much so yeah, I, yeah. My, we we had no money and um i remember that my father o o o almost bled in agony when i first went to secondary school and he saw the book list 
and realize how much the books would cost because um, I, I failed to gain a scholarship to secondary school. Um, there were very few and, um, and he had to pay for them. And he was absolutely horrified, but yeah. he, 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 he painfully made those sacrifices and um, I, I owe him everything for that. So what age were you when you made your decision to, to leave the West Indies and come to London? I, in my 30s, and I've now lived here in London much, much longer than I lived in the West Indies. Yeah. So it, and it, it was, a, it was a, a huge, huge um, movement, for, you know, move for me, for me to make. Um, I was terrified, but many, many West Indians had done it before. Yeah. And um, I was following a, a well-trodden path. And, you know, to people living in the Caribbean, London was almost the center of the world. It was the metropolitan center. It was the center of what used to be the great British empire. And we were all drawn towards London, almost in a magnetic sort of way. And my colleagues in America always used to tease me many years later and say, you know, you crossed, you cross the American continent, which is much, much closer to you, to go all the way, 4,000 miles away to London. Why? And I said to them, because we were, uh, we were colonies of the, the British Empire. Right. And, we, and, and th th there was a kind of gravitational pull towards London. And I was, I was part of that. Yeah, and of course, you, you were, came after the Windrush generation. And that's something we might briefly discuss because that's also very topical. Uh, uh, I mean, what are your feelings about the, the, uh, the policy that made life so difficult for the Windrush generation under Theresa May, I think, largely? It's very difficult to read the stories of what happened to that generation of people, especially those who were... Uh, on the wrong end of um, whatever the ruling was of the Home Office in those days, and who were deported, in many cases, to countries which they never knew um, mm. because they were the offspring of people who made the original journey. And the, the, the one thing I've always felt consistently ab about it was about the policy which, which generated that scandal. It was described as a hostile immigration policy. I cannot for the life of me understand why you need to use the word hostile in connection with an immigration policy. It could be a effective policy. It could be thorough uh, 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 policy. It could be something which made sure that people who were not supposed to be in the country are not there. But why does it have to be hostile? Why, why use that word? And to go on much later on and to do odd things like having trucks in North London saying to people, go home, go home. I thought that was contrary to everything that we believe, we West Indians believed about this country. A country which had always had a reputation for fairness and for treating people in, in, in a very generous and, and, and scrupulously minded way. Um, I, I, I was quite shocked by that. Well, I think uh, a lot of our audience will be too. So, so Trevor, you, you came to London. You, you'd been quite a successful broadcaster in the West Indies before you came. Isn't that right? You, you'd done a lot of news work then. You, you decided to be a reporter in the West Indies and then you made the transfer across. Um, but Bush House, I think I, in your book, you describe it as being a, a multinational, exciting environment, it's certainly a magnificent building made out of Portland stone, I think built in about 1910. If yes. I remember, yeah. Tell us a little bit about Bush House. It was a United Nations of broadcasting. Mm. And what was wonderful about it was its universality. Not only was it universal in the way that it broadcast to the world, but the people you worked with came from different corners of the world. And so you would have breakfast in the morning with somebody from China. In the afternoon, you would have a cup of tea with somebody from Uganda. And then in the evening in the bar, which we always resorted to after six o'clock, um, um, you know, you, you, you drink with people from India or, or Pakistan. Um, and, and it was, it was you know, it, it had that, that, that world view, not only in what it broadcast, but in the people you met. And it was always, I remember, uh, um, it was always a shock when you left 
the environs of Bush House and went into the Strand and realized there was another world out there because Bush House enveloped you in a world which was quite different to the one that London actually represented. Um, but it was, and it's a wonderful place to learn and, and, and to get to the rudiments of broadcasting. And, you know, it's wonderful to know that today the World Service is still, uh, you, you know, one of the finest broadcasting services created anywhere in the world. I know lots of people, my colleagues abroad, medics abroad, who say they, they listen to BBC World Service because it's, uh, it's neutral, it doesn't, it doesn't take sides, and, and it's factual, and it has trust. And so many broadcasting services elsewhere are partisan and, and cannot be trusted. On that, you know, it's so important, the point you make there. Um, it was at the BBC that I learned the the importance of broadcasting, which was, as you say, which was fair, where the reports had to be accurate and well-balanced and fairly reported. And it's one of the cornerstones uh, of, of broadcasting in the, in the BBC. And it was one of the things I learned and, and have tried to follow throughout my, my broadcasting life, learned there at, at the BBC. Yeah. So, and... and um... So then you left the BBC uh, and you went to ITN. So that must have been um, a significant move in your life. You probably put that down as one of the key, key moves. Just talk us through that. Um, that. Those are exciting times, of course, in the 1970s. Key move, though it was, um, uh, it, it came about partly as a bit of a dare. I had done some television work in Trinidad when television came there just before I left. I had done an interview program called Dialogue. And I used probably a little too glibly to boast to my friends at Bush House where we were doing only radio. I used to say to them, do you know, I've, I've done some television in the West Indies. And after I said this about three dozen times, they, they would say to me, if you think you're so good at this television business, there's this new place called ITN. Why don't you, why don't you apply to them? Why don't you see whether you could find a place there? And I did. I went to IT and I applied and I went for an interview and I was quite shocked when I was actually offered a job. And um, in fact, so shocked I was that um, I said to the editor who, who made the offer, I said, well, can I go home and think about it for a little while before accepting? I came back to Bush House and told my friends what had occurred and they rounded on me in the <laughs> most alarming way and said you so and so why don't you get back onto the telephone and accept it now yeah. and so i was <laughs> i was kind of bounced into accepting it although i must confess that i had no real idea in the round what it would mean and what it would do to my life in england mm -hmm. i i couldn't foresee and again that improbability which i've mentioned in the book um, came in because I could never have imagined that uh, my life at ITN would have taken me on on a course which was well well to make my life really. And ITN in those days was based in Well Street in um, That's right. in, in uh, well not just north of Soho in um, Fit, Fitz. Uh, I'm, I'm blocking on the name of it now. I ought to remember because I was at the Middlesex Hospital. In that, that was very, very era. close. We used to walk past there on uh, the way to all the rest. Charlotte, in Charlotte Street. Uh, yes. Well Street. And the advertising uh, business started there as well, didn't it? So it, it had a vibrancy, that, that particular area. Uh, and the restaurants were full and the bars were full and so on. But, but just talk us through what it was like joining... ITN. Did you, you go straight into the news at 10 when you were there as a, or were you doing reporting before you became newscaster? I went into reporting, um, which is what I wanted to do. And um, it is, I think, fair to say that I was quite, I was not absolutely sure about why I had been employed. <clears throat> All through my life, my interest was in international politics. And I made it clear to ITN that that is what I wanted to do while, while I was a reporter there. And I wanted to be part of the biggest stories of the time. Right. I'm 
you may say that you know every reporter wants to 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 do that of course but one of the biggest stories of the time was northern ireland and i wanted to be seen to do exactly what all the other reporters did, did. i didn't want to be the token black reporter i wanted to be part of the itn which reported all the news mm -hmm. as as best as it could and 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 that's why i I ended up on the route that, that, that my career took me. Just talk us through those Northern Ireland days, because the 1970s was the, the real beginning and the worst elements of the Troubles, uh, and bloody uh, uh, the paratrooper massacres and, uh, and so on and so forth preceded the... But just talk us through, what was it like being sent to Northern Ireland? It must have been scary. Absolutely terrifying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, and I, I lived in terror. I'm by nature a pretty cowardly person. And I had never seen uh, um, mach submachine guns. Um, they were not the currency of West Indian life. I'd never heard a bomb go off. And yet that was the, that was the daily diet of life in Northern Ireland. I was called out to explosions in which people died. We were called out one morning to uh, uh, an incident in which uh, uh, an army v v van had crossed a culvert and blown to pieces. And I could see, you, you know, it, it, bits of bodies on, in the gorse bushes. And I, I mean, I lived in constant terror and fear. I remember my colleagues used to tease me that whenever um, there was a large explosion or something, I would always make an excuse and find a house and my excuse was that I must call the office in London, of course, in the days before mobile telephones, um, to tell ITN what's going on. But it was also, it was to do that, of course, but it was also to get away from the immediacy of the mayhem and the, the expressions of hate and destruction and devastation that was all, all around you. Mm. I, I found it absolutely terrifying. What was the scariest thing? Did you ever get any personal threats against you? I was personally threatened one afternoon. There was a, a very attractive young lady who I, I had caught sight of in the crowd somewhere down in Londonderry. There was a mass demonstration going on there. And I could see her coming towards me and, and she kept coming and she came right up close. And I'm sure that this did happen. I'm not making this up because at the end of it, my cameraman who was recording all this said to me, I heard that we're getting out of here. But she said to me, I, I have listened to you. I don't like what you do. And if you come back here, you'll never leave, you'll never leave alive. Um, that was all the warning I needed. I, I left in quite a hurry. And, uh, for some time, I never went back. <laughs> I think most of us would do that. And then didn't, didn't you, wasn't there an occasion when you were staying in the famous Europa Hotel that got blown up more, more times than in any other hotel in the world, I think, blown up 10 or 20 times. I forget the number now. Tell us, tell us your Hotel Europa story. Yes, we all stayed there because all the journalists stayed there. And um, the journalists stayed there, I suspect, because all the gossip went around. Um, it was very difficult to find out what the IRA or the UDF were about unless you met your colleagues from Northern Ireland. And the, the, the bar at the Europa Hotel was a great gossipy place, especially at Saturday lunchtime. And, um, you know, and the bombers certainly got wind of the fact that we were there. And at the heart of it, uh, the, the, the bombers were interested in, in getting the publicity for the mayhem that they caused. And so they would bomb the hotel where the journalists were staying. It made a kind of crazy good sense, really. And that is what happened. And I was there um, half a dozen times when it was bombed. On one occasion, um, most of the occasions, we were told to get out. Um, and I should say that there was no evidence that the bombs were meant at, 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 at us. Um, we were always given warning in time to get out. And on one occasion, I decided after the bomb had gone off to stay in the hotel and persuaded the manager to give us a lavish dinner, although all the windows had been blown out. He did that and uh, complimented it with some lovely wine from the cellar. Um, so the, in a bombed out hotel, we, we had a, a, a wonderful dinner with discursive conversations about life. And um, I remember that. <laughs> I remember that particularly well.
Well, let, let's talk a little bit about South Africa because uh, obviously um, uh, that, that in, in a way exemplifies the, the issue of racism, which was uh, in the 70s was so embedded in, in South Africa. And Nelson Mandela, you know, stands as a, as a giant in history, uh, as, a, as a person who stood up against it. Uh, so just tell us a little bit about your experiences in, in South Africa, Trevor. South Africa astonished me. I was never, um, I, I had read about it. I had written angry essays about it in the later years of my later school years, but I could never understand how it was possible for so small a population, uh, so small a part of the population, 10, 12%, to control in such a brutal way 80% of the other people in South Africa, the whites against the blacks. And it, it, it was a matter of absolute control. And I, I could never understand how, how you could get away with that for so long. And I, I used to say so to my white South African friends. And, and um, I, I found the reality of apartheid and the reality of the separation of peoples quite abhorrent. So it was an amazing time to be there when Mandela was released and to see that and to feel that sense of hope that things would change for the better. And in Mandela, South Africa was terribly, terribly lucky. After 27 unconscionably long years in prison, he emerged as a person who was so conspicuously unbitter. He, he, he envisaged a South Africa, which he kept saying, which should be a country of all the peoples, where all the peoples should take part in the way the country was run. And he did that at a time when he had got no real promises from F.W. de Klerk, who was the prime minister at the time, that there would be basic things like one man, one vote. He was trying to sell to the ANC a deal that he had done without any real assurances about what the outcome would be. I thought that was extraordinary. I mean, almost insanely courageous. And um, I must confess, I, I admired that because I'd never met anyone who who could take that leap. I kept saying to him when I interviewed him that, you know, there's no way that there's going to be an accommodation between the National Party and the ANC. You know, you might be a very good man, but you can't possibly make this happen. And he kept saying to me, if you're prepared to talk seriously and you're prepared to compromise, everything is possible. And I, I said, no, 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 everything is not possible. Peripheral things are possible, but fundamental principles you must abide by. He said, no, if you're prepared to make sacrifices and to talk seriously, everything is possible. I found that extraordinary. And, and was he, you know, I've read his book, uh, Long Road to Freedom, fantastic book, but was he a, a charismatic person or, you know, he was a lawyer originally, wasn't he, before? Uh, what was he like as a person, Trevor? You probably got to know him quite well. So just give us your, your insight to, to, to Nelson as a Mandela as a person. I was very fortunate to get to know him reasonably well. Yeah. He, he was a very, it was a very humble man. He, 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 his charisma was in his history and, and, and what he'd suffered. He was not a great speaker. Um, I don't think he could command a crowd. He did because of who he was. The other thing I was struck by was his lack of any bitterness. I tried in that first interview when I met him to get him to talk about how terrible it had been in, in prison for 27 long years. And, and, and he said, you know, oh, all that's in the past. I said, but it must have been absolutely horrible for you to spend so many years away from your family and from your comrades in the ANC, all in the past, he said. But how were you treated? Oh, that's all in the past. And then before the Rugby World Cup in 1995, I went back to South Africa to interview him. And he asked, and, and this is a, a, something that we would understand doing an interview in this way about the importance of the lighting, getting the lighting right. 
and he asked us consistently to turn the lights down, he said, because I can't see if you can keep the lights up. And I kept saying to him, well, you know, Mr. President, in television, we must have some light and, and um, we can't turn them down anymore. And he, he then said almost apologetically, he said, do, do you know, it's my eyes. I, they, they, they have been damaged from my um, work breaking rocks on Robin Island. Mm. It was the first intimation he had ever given. And I had known him then for several years. Yeah. The first time he'd ever even suggested any hardship from being there. His eyes had been damaged from breaking rocks on Robin Island. Wow. Yeah. That lack of bitterness and that I, I found quite extraordinary. Yeah. I think there are, there are very few people who will ever be remembered in, in the same way that Nelson Mandela. Uh, perhaps David Attenborough is, a, is another iconic individual. Uh, how, how would you, there's a question in from Dr. Henry Nagy, uh, who's, who's actually watching this in, uh, in Ghana, in Accra. He, he's saying, how would you like to be remembered? Uh, oh, gosh. Trevor? <laughs> I, have, I haven't got there yet. <laughs> yeah. despite, despite the ravages of COVID, I'm hoping that there'll be, uh, um, I, um, if, if, if um, the Ghanaian doctor is, I've, I'm, I'm a great, great hand washer. If, um, if, um, if hand washing keeps you alive, I'm hoping to be there for some time. No, I, I, I don't, I like to think that I have made a success in some of the things that, that I have done as a reporter. I like to think that I have, you, you know, explored some areas um, I, I, where, where people haven't been before. Um, and then I brought my particular slant to, to, to the experience. But no, I don't, I, don't, I, I don't think very much of being remembered in that way. Well, there are 27 questions and we haven't got time to, to ask <laughs> them all. But Peter Wis Wisniewski, uh, Dr. Wisniewski, uh, uh, says, what's your most entertaining interview? What, which interview did you enjoy the most? If you, uh, uh, Pete, Peter, you should read uh, another plug for this fantastic book. You should read the book because actually there are so many interesting interview, uh, descriptions of interviews in it. But uh, we're, off the top of your head, would you choose one or two interviews? Yes, when I left ITN, I started, I was very lucky in being given the chance to do some documentaries. And, um, and I, I did, well, one of the things, I went to a, um, a state prison in Indiana in America, which I, I was, is not my natural habitat, really. I, I never thought of doing any programs in a prison. And some of these people I found were absolutely fascinating. And I was interested in, what brought these people to that part of their lives? You know, how did you end up in prison being there, you know, being given 30 years for killing somebody or something? And I remember talking to one man, the thing which surprised me about it um, was that people were so honest about, about what had brought them there. And one man said to me, he said, do you know, in, a, in, in one way, I was always destined to end up in a place like this because I'm not a very, very, very good person. And if I am let out of here tomorrow and I don't have any money and I have a gun, I might do something awful. And I was quite struck by how boldly honest that was. And when I look back at some of the things that I've done, I'm, I'm, I was really grateful for the fact that these people opened up to me so much of their lives because that is what we do and that is what we ask of people when we interview them. And they, they did it, uh, uh, um, you know, wonderfully well, despite the desperate circumstances in which they had found themselves. Mm -hmm. Lynn McLean, I'm not sure whether she's a doctor or not. Uh, you don't have to be a doctor to be a member of the Royal Society of Medicine. We have associate members. We, we, we welcome all members, uh, actually. Uh, people, uh, the more people that join us, the, the, the happier we are. Lynn McLean says, have you personally experienced any incident of racism uh, which is embedded in your memory? Because, I mean, I think you stand out as, as an icon of anti-racism, which is uh, we think brilliant, like Nelson Mandela, but you must have experienced, especially in the early days where racism was so embedded in, in the UK in the 70s and 80s, 
Trevor. Did you ever find yourself in, in that sort of situation? I was told much later on that when I first appeared on ITN, there were people who rang up quite angrily saying, what is this black man doing on our screens? Mm. And um, the editor who took the call, um, and he personally told me this story, he said, um, I, I replied that um, um, I'm terribly sorry to say that you might be seeing him for a very, very long time. So get used to it. No, I, I, you know, people regarded me in a certain way and I had very little to do with them. I think one of the, the strange things about this business into which I, I got myself is that if you appear with a television camera, you always, there is between you and the person that you're interviewing or between you and the circumstances, there's always this camera and people are mesmerized by cameras. And so, so much of the attitude which they would have had for me was probably obscured by the presence of a camera crew and the, 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 the camera itself. I remember in, in Northern Ireland, um, I, I had a, a, a crew from Ulster Television with me and they were all, uh, um, you know, white Ulster men. And um, somebody passed and said, you know, why don't you, why don't you British go back to where you belong? And I looked at them, forgetting for a while that they were from Ulster, from Northern Ireland. And um, I was looking at them uh, at that insult hurled, I thought, at us. And they looked at me, I th they said, I think the lady is referring to you. So <laughs> <laughs> we all had a great laugh about it. Yeah, you know, these things would occur. I didn't suffer particularly from that. Um, I, I think I've had, a, in many respects, a charmed life, really. And part of that, as I say, has to do with the fact that I was in this medium which had all this machinery around it. Talking of machinery, you know, I'm, I'm a prostate surgeon and uh, people say, oh, did you find that terribly stressful? Or well, to be honest, I didn't because, you know, we pretty much, once, you, once you've learned how to do the operation, you do it again and again and again. But uh, I imagine that working in the news at 10 uh, in a broadcasting environment when you've got so many things going on around you and in, in the background, you've got people playing clips, maybe sometimes the wrong clip if you've got news, breaking news halfway through your programming. And how, did you find it stressful? Did, you, did it wear you out? It wore me out. Um, I was always very, very tired at the end of an evening and at the end of the week, I was half dead really after mm. doing News at 10 for five nights a week. Um, what was stressful as you rightly point out, Professor Kirby, was the unpredictability of it all. Um, but after a while you learn to spot dangers before, before they happen. I always had all that was going on in the control gallery in my airpiece. And the reason I had that, although it could be very disturbing and, and um, at times distressing, but the reason I, I, I did that was I could hear some trouble before it actually happened. You'd hear somebody in the, in the, in the control room saying, oh no, I don't believe that that is happening. At which point, you know, you must wake up and, and um, shape up because something is about to be visited on you, which you, you didn't expect. It was stressful. Um, but it was part of the job and it was, I'd, I'd always had this, this, this view just to be slightly boring for a while that this business of conveying information to people in a way that makes it relevant to their lives is one of the most important things in a functioning democracy. Why, why should somebody sitting in a dressing, in a, in a living room in Norfolk, um, be interested in what happens in Aleppo in Syria? It's our responsibility to make it relevant to the circumstances in which they live or to the way they perceive the world. And I thought that was desperately, desperately important. And that accounted for part of the stress to make sure you, to make sure you got it right. Of course, we didn't always, um, but we tried. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Aleppo and uh, yeah, another of your very famous interviewees was, uh, uh, Mr. Saddam, Saddam Hussein, General Saddam Hussein. Just, uh, I've just watched a fantastic uh, documentary series called uh, One, uh, uh, let me just remember it now, um, Once Upon a Time in, in Iraq. Iraq, fantastic. yes. 
uh, series. Excellent. But Excellent. you you actually got to meet um, the the general. So just tell us a little bit about Saddam and that interview. That sounds interesting. Yes, again, it was I was asked to to do the, to do this to cultivate the Iraqi authorities in London. Um, um, my my memories ab ab about meeting him in Baghdad are mixed with meeting his emissary in London, who was a young Iraqi diplomat who enjoyed all the nightlife that London had to offer. <clears throat> and every morning as I went, before I went into the office, I stopped off in Tottenham Court Road um, to, to meet um, the I Iraqi e e emissary there. And um, he was most disorganized and kept saying to me, I got a response from Baghdad the other day, but I can't find it on my desk. But anyway, in due course, I was asked to go to Baghdad. Saddam Hussein himself was, was, was very businesslike. He didn't quite like the questions I asked. Um, what was interesting to me though, above all, was the fact that when I went to see him, there were about 10 of the people from his inner cabinet sitting around in this interview. And I had um, taken the precautions, I hope I'm not speaking too much out of turn here, of taking pills to keep my nerves quiet uh, at, at certain stages because the Iraqis had a way of making you feel a little uncomfortable. Um, but even so, I, 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 I let my temper show a little bit and I said to one of them, I said, why are all you guys sitting around waiting to see me interview your president? Don't you have anything to do in an evening in Baghdad? And one of them took me aside <clears throat> and he said something to me which I will never forget. <laughs> because it was very important. He said to me, you don't understand this country, do you? You don't understand our president. We never ever see him sit down and be questioned and be made to answer questions. In other words, there was not Iraqi prime minister or Iraqi president's question time on television in Baghdad. And people, <clears throat> excuse me, people never saw Saddam being made to answer questions. But I was asking questions and he agreed to answer them. And to them, that was a most extraordinary event. And just to make the point clearer, some years ago, many, many years ago, um, after that interview, I ran into uh, uh, somebody in, in Knightsbridge who came up to me after I'd had a long dinner and said to me, you don't remember me, do you? And, and, and I confess that I hadn't, partly because I'd probably had too much to drink. And um, I, I said to him, no, I'm sorry, I don't. And he wasn't at all amused by the fact that I didn't remember him. And he said to me, I was your interpreter when you interviewed Saddam Hussein. I thought it was the most extraordinary to meet up with such a person in Knightsbridge. And he confirmed this business about Saddam never being made to address difficult questions once a minister who this interpreter said to me was a friend of his had questioned the decision by the president the minister was taken out he was shot and saddam hussein continued having the meeting in in his office so questions weren't frequently asked of the iraqi president and i got the chance to do it um, <laughs> as i say he wasn't um, he wasn't terribly pleased at some of the questions but uh, <laughs> His emissaries told me that uh, much later. I must say, one of my frustrations is that our current uh, prime minister uh, so seldom appears uh, on TV to be questioned. Uh, although I think Keir Starmer gives him quite a, a hard time at prime minister's question time, but he's very reluctant to appear on Newsnight or uh, ITN News at ten. Um, one, uh, I'm not allowed to call you Sir Trevor, but I know that um, when you interviewed George Bush Jr., he insisted on calling you Sir Trevor. Just tell us that little story. Well, it's a great, it's a great joke. Um, I, I always tell it because um, in, in the first place, um, the president's policies, especially in relation to the invasion of Iraq, didn't coincide with mine. I thought that was a very bad idea. I still, I still think so. So I went to interview him about, about Iraq and he didn't want to talk about this for too long and said after about 10 minutes when I had been hoping for about half an hour, I'll, I'll take you on a tour of the White House, um, the West Wing. 
and I'll take you into the Oval Office. I must confess, much to my shame, I didn't at that time see what a brilliant opportunity this was for me and for viewers because we took our cameras with us. And he did take me to the West Wing and he kept saying, you know, Sir Trevor, Sir Trevor. And at one point I said to him, you know, Mr. President, my name is Trevor and um, this is a republic, the United States is, and you guys don't have any respect for titles like these. And in some cases, I know, I'm mentioning none of them, um, they are pretty useless, some of these titles. And he said to me, oh, no, 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 you mustn't say that. My father has one. <laughs> and of course, I had totally forgotten that uh, George Bush Sr. had been given an honorary knighthood by the Queen. So <laughs> it was not um, very wise of me to criticize honors of this sort, especially to the sitting president of the United States. But I must also add that he then took me into the Oval Office and journalists can be very blasé and we don't always understand the full dimension of what's happening to us or the situations in which we find ourselves. And after a while I thought, wow, being shown around the Oval Office by a sitting president of the United States, that's not a bad day's work. <laughs> Well, we, we ought to just tell the, uh, the viewers that some people may recognize the background behind uh, Trevor, uh, Sir Trevor, is, um, is, is actually my house. So I, I, we should say that we are, this interview is taking place in my house. I'm in one room and Trevor's in the other room. And we're just about uh, maybe 500 yards away from the All England Lawn Tennis Club, of which you are a member, Trevor. Uh, and I think another member is a, is a friend of mine and a big friend of yours, Sir Marcus Setchell. Uh, who actually uh, helped us set up this interview. So thank you, Marcus. Marcus, by, by the way, I should mention, is uh, raising money for the 900th anniversary of St. Bartholomew's Hospital. They are working very hard to restore the amazing Great Hall there. So good luck with that, Marcus. But tell us a little bit about the All England um, Tennis Club. Uh, I, I believe you, you drop in there, don't you, Trevor? Is that right? Well, it's, it's, it, the nice thing about it, it's uh, for a club with such a great, great history, it's a place which you could also casually drop into. Of course, COVID has uh, made that impossible at the moment. It's a little more regimented now. But it's, it's a wonderful club because it's this great institution, but it's also a friendly um, and, and sort of family-oriented club in, in, to which you can feel at home. And I've had um, some great, great games of tennis with, with Marcus, who I think is a, is a great, great player. And I'm waiting to hear all his stories about having played on the centre court, um, which we were all allowed to do uh, uh, as a one-off a few, few we weeks ago. But no, it's, it's a lovely place. And um, I, it's always wonderful to meet up with, with people like Marcus and to enjoy their company and to, and to play in a, in, in a club which has such a great, great history. Special place. Well, Lawrence, Lawrence McGinty says, you love cricket. Would, would you have sacrificed your journalistic career if you could have played test cricket? That's quite a good question. Um, Lawrence McGinty is very kind. He's a great, great, great friend and a wonderful, wonderful journalist who helped uh, in the establishing of Channel 4 News to what it, what it is still today. Um, no, um, and the one reason is, try as I might, I was never very, very good at it. I, um, I, it, it was the ambition of every West Indian um, to be a great cricketer. We all wanted to be Frank Worrell or Garfield Sobers or, or somebody like that. But um, no, I, I don't think I would have sacrificed um, my reporting life um, to try and play a game at which I have a funny feeling I would not have been that good, Lawrence. But thank you very much for asking. <laughs> who, who is your all-time favourite West Indian uh, Caribbean cricketer? I got Not to know, bit, I, maybe? I, was, I was terribly lucky to, to, to get to know quite, I mean, I, mean I, I wrote a couple of books on Clive Lloyd and Viv Richards and I met Garfield Sobers, but I also knew Frank Worrell and just before, um, just about two years ago, I was asked to go to the Caribbean to do um, uh, uh, the Frank Worrell Memorial Lecture, which I eagerly um, mm. uh, uh, accepted to do. And, we stopped off in Barbados to pick up Sir Everton Weeks, who um, recently passed away. And I spent several 
evenings in his company after we did our duties um, for which we were invited to Trinidad. And I must confess, sitting, talking to Everton Weeks about his days in cricket, um, and he was 90 even then, and, and so a, a bit frail, but his, his reminiscences were absolutely splendid and, and resplendent too in their telling. And um, I remember that with great, great fondness. So happy days spent at Lords and the Oval watching Wes Hall, Garfield Sobers, Bib Richards, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we're running a little bit out of time, but um, this interview is, I could speak, uh, uh, we could continue for some time, but we, we better not be too late. Paul Dinsdale, I think, is asking an important question here. He wants to know, what's your view on statues related to historical figures and slavery being removed from public places? That's yes, public. I don't get too excited about it. I must confess I didn't shed too many tears when I heard about that one being um, thrown into the river in Bristol. But it seems to me that there are bigger issues to be dealt with. Um, I can understand why some people take offense at, 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 at statues and so on. It's, it's not one of the things on my agenda. I think there are more pertinent issues of, of injustice and inequality which, which should be addressed. And we, we hear about them every day. And, you know, Professor Kirby, in your, in your own field, we hear about the, 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 the terrors that some people who are trying to help us cope with, with COVID-19, all those people who work in the care homes and who work in the hospitals uh, and, and in the theaters, uh, the, 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 the jobs they have and the pressure under which they are. I, I, I am much more engrossed in seeing them treated well and seeing them being given all the equipment they need to do their job. Those, those are the things that preoccupy me much, much more. Yeah, I can, I can see that. And, and do you think that, that television news now is uh, as good as it was in, in the heyday of ITN News at 10? Do you, do you, do you think that um, it's the BBC and ITV News is, is as good? Is it still as balanced, as, as informative, as well presented? Yes, it's, it, it's always possible to look at the past through rose-tinted glasses and think, you know, we were so much better in those days. I think the news organizations in this country continue to do, by and large, a very, very good job of keeping people well informed. I think also the multiplicity of sources from which you can get the news in this country um, is, is a plus. Um, I think we are always well informed. We all have our prejudices and our own biases, and we will read certain newspapers for a certain reason. But I think in general, we, we are pretty well informed. I think too that do you know, um, all governments today or the whole business of governance is a very, very difficult thing because, um, you know, we are all so critical. We expect so much. We make so many demands of those who we put in power. I think it's right that we should, but I, I don't think it's an, it's an easy job. So in, in that, in that, and in the in, as I said, the, the, the various platforms from which you can get your news these days, trying to wade through what's important and what is balanced and what is not, is not an easy task. But I think we do a pretty good job of it. Those are nice sentiments. Uh, it, it's just coming up to, to eight o'clock. Uh, so I, I think it's time to say thank you so much for taking the time and trouble. Um, I will be entertaining uh, uh, you for supper straight afterwards. My wife's cooked a nice meal, so you come next door and we can we can have supper together and carry on this conversation. Uh, I should mem uh, mention to our listeners, uh, our, our people watching this program, uh, that next week uh, in conversation is with Lloyd Dorfman uh, from Master Chef, who uh, is author of another book that um, uh, I'm going to show you here. Uh, I picked up a copy from. Uh, uh, from a bookshop today. Uh, it's called An Elephant in Rome and Lloyd Grossman character is uh, a pop star actually, play, uh, uh, plays guitar as well as writes interesting books. So I think that, that interview should be a lot of fun. So I do hope you'll join me for that. I should also mention that our very popular COVID-19 series, we've been uh, undertaking an ongoing series of COVID-19 uh, issues 
is tomorrow, and I shall be interviewing uh, Professor Derek Alderson, who uh, Alderson, who is uh, immediate past president of the Royal College of Surgeons, and we've got two uh, surgeons from the coalface: uh, Ben Chalicum, a urologist at uh, at uh, Guy's and St Thomas's, and Hannah Warren, who's at King's, who's a trainee uh, urologist, very nice uh, 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 female surgeon, uh, and we'll be talking about uh, the issues of the of the increasing waiting list. I think there are 4 million people now waiting uh, for treatment on the NHS because of COVID-19. It is a major issue. So I do hope you'll join me. That's at uh, 12.30 tomorrow and 7 o'clock next evening, Lloyd Dorfman. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, we've loved, I've loved talking to you and I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to uh, ask you all the questions that have come through. There are 44 questions here, but um, this uh, interview will be on our YouTube channel, uh, and it's been uh, absolutely so nice to speak to you, Sir Trevor. I, I think you're an icon uh, uh, as a communicator, uh, as, uh, and I've loved hearing your views about uh, the racism uh, through the 70s, 80s, and now still, unfortunately, a current issue. But uh, people like you, I think, standing up, saying the, uh, the sensible things, uh, and, and, and talking about Nelson Mandela, who you met personally, is, is really uh, inspirational to us all. So thank you, uh, everybody. Thank you, Sir Trevor. Thank you for all our listeners. And thank you for the Tanya uh, uh, and uh, Maddie and the team who help uh, put this program together. Uh, we'll see you next yeah, week. I say thank you all. And uh, it's been a great honor to, to, to appear with you, Professor Kirby. Thank you. Thank you and good night.